Meeting to order for Tuesday, February the 4th. Looking to the agenda, are there any changes or additions? Seeing none, I'll move the agenda be approved as presented. Those in favor? Opposed? Motion's carried unanimously. Looking then to the minutes of January 14th, regular meeting of council, are there errors or omissions? Seeing none, I'll move they be adopted as presented. Those in favor? Opposed? Motion's carried unanimously. And we'll move right into item G1, designated officers bylaw amendment 2020-02. Ms. Hyde. Thank you. Good morning. Uh, this is a very uh, quick request. It's housekeeping in nature. Our designated officers bylaw uh, sets out various positions uh, that are required by the Municipal Government Act to be designated officers. And there was a change recently made um, in the Red Tape Reduction Act to eliminate the requirement for clerks to the ARB, the um, Assessment Review Board, and the Subdivision and Development Appeal Board to be designated officers. And it wasn't really an emergency to get this um, done, but it does cause a little bit of confusion if people are looking at the bylaw and wondering why um, we aren't following the rules. So we decided it would be a good idea just to ask you to amend the bylaw right now and remove that requirement for the designated officers. We already have um, two people uh, who've completed in the training in each area. So um, we're asking you to appoint those people to meet the requirements of the MGA, which says council may appoint a person to carry out these positions. So that's it, we're asking for three readings of the designated officer bylaw amendment, and we're asking you to appoint Megan Dalrymple and Janae Shepard to the ARB clerk position, and Joel Noel and Jane D to clerks of the SDAB. And that's it. Thank you very much. Are there any questions from members of council? Seeing none, it seems fairly straightforward. Thanks Thank for you. that presentation. That they will give, I will move the council give first reading to the designated officers bylaw amendment 2020 02, clerk of the assessment review boards and the subdivision and development appeal board. Discussion on that motion? Seeing none, I'll call the question. Those in favor? Opposed? Motion's carried unanimously. I'll move the council give second reading to the designated officers bylaw amendment 2020 02. Discussion on that motion? Seeing none, I'll call the question. Those in favor, opposed? Motion's carried unanimously. And I'll move the council go to third reading of the designated officers bylaw. Discussion on, no, there is no discussion. Those in favor, opposed? Motion's carried unanimously. And I'll move the council give third reading to the designated officers bylaw amendment 2020 02. Clerk of the Assessment Review Boards and the Subdivision and Development Appeal Board. Discussion on that motion. Seeing none, I'll call the question. Those in favor? Opposed? Motion's carried unanimously. I'll then move the council appoint Megan Dalrymple, Property Tax Coordinator, and Janai Shepard, Tax and Utility mm -hmm. Assistant, to act as clerks of the Assessment Review Boards. Any discussion on that motion? Seeing none, I'll call the question. Those in favor? Opposed? Motion's carried unanimously. And I'll move the council appoint Jolene Noel, Planning and Development and Administrative Assistant, and Jane Dean, Permit Clerk, to act as clerks of the Subdivision and Development Appeal Board. Discussion on those motions or that motion? Seeing none, I'll call the question. Those in favor? Opposed? Motion's carried unanimously. Move on then to item H1, the Safe Park Pilot Program. Ms. Gilchrist. Mayor Borman, members of council, I'm here today to share with you the design of the Safe Park Pilot Program and to recommend that council approve the implementation of the Safe Park Pilot Program as presented for the 2020 season beginning May 4th and concluding on October 2nd. 
as I begin to outline this model, I think it's important to keep in mind that we've designed this model based on the data collection from 2019, as well as research into best practices and innovative solutions that other communities have implemented um, to try and mitigate van dwelling. The goals of the program are to provide a seasonal, safe, affordable, and regulated parking stall for employed vehicle dwellers in Canmore. And it's also to implement a program that minimizes the negative community perceptions of van dwelling. The elements of the program involve the use of 50 stalls that are scattered site and multi-use. Scattered site means in groups of five, and then the multi-use means that the parking stalls will only be used by the Safe Park program during the hours of operation for the program, which begin at 8 p.m. and end at 9 a.m. The rest of the time, those parking stalls can be utilized for public parking, for patrons of that business, or um, someone visiting the uh, private property with which the parking lots will be used. Um, also, $10 a night will be the cost to those stalls. So based on this scattered site model, we've got 10 lots required, five which would be municipal lots and five which will be privately owned lots. The municipally owned lots chosen are based on proximity to residential properties, proximity to washrooms, and the historical use of certain lots uh, for vehicle dwelling in the past. The map outlines the five proposed municipally owned sites, which include the Elk Run Ball Diamonds parking lot, the back lot at the Rec Canmore Recreation Center, the front lot uh, at Arts Place, behind uh, the Economic Development Building, and behind Panago Pizza. The privately owned lots, to date we've had preliminary conversation with three uh, privately owned lots. Those include Trinity Bible Church, Save On Foods, and Our Lady of the Rockies Parish. Uh, until it is approved, we sort of got to a place in those conversations where people remain interested in participating, but and we have not yet negotiated final contract, and we will also be looking to engage additional um, private owners if and when we get approval today. Uh, during the program implementation, it's also important to note that these lots will be filled sort of one at a time. So we will choose uh, a privately owned lot, fill it to capacity, and then a municipally owned lot, fill it to capacity. And also be aware of various needs and timing of some of the uh, locations of lots. So for example, the Canmore Recreation Center, hockey sort of ramps up in September. So it will be one of the first lots in the fall as we will see less employed vehicle dwellers in the valley that will be vacated to allow for um, hockey patrons to use the back lot more in uh, the later hours of the evening. In order for people to participate in the program, there will be an eligibility criteria. These are the minimum requirements. We may have negotiation with private owners that uh, add some additional requirements, but at the very minimum, people need to be employed in the Bow Valley. They need to have a valid driver's license, a valid vehicle registration, and valid insurance. In order to participate, people will be asked to sign an agreement that outlines guidelines that they agree to say they understand and agree to adhere to. Some of the um, guidelines will include continued eligibility with proving your employment on the 15th and 30th of each month. Respectful behavior between uh, vehicle dwellers, with the coordinator of the program, with bylaw services. Uh, we don't want any people behaving in an aggressive, uh, disrespectful manner. People need to be using the washroom facilities that are provided. They need to enter and vacate the stall within the program guidelines of 8 p.m. to 9 a.m. Uh, disposal of waste into the bare safe bins that will be provided, keeping equipment and supplies contained within their vehicle, 
respecting wildlife, refraining from criminal behavior, and parking outside of the downtown core during those peak parking hours of 10 a.m. to 5 p.m. So in order for those elements of the program to be successful, there's a few things we really need to have in place. And first and foremost is a program coordinator. That program coordinator will be responsible for screening um, and approving or declining participants. Um, and they also will be doing the bi-monthly uh, renewals. They'll act as a point of contact to our community partners, to the bylaw services team, and to the private security company we will be having doing late night uh, and evening patrols. The program coordinator will also be responsible to follow up on any participant guideline violations. Uh, and that would not necessarily be them specifically following up, but including bylaw and and judging what is a minor infraction that somebody needs to be informed of as a warning and what is something that they need support with uh, our bylaw services team in order to remove someone from the property or enforce something. They're also going to be responsible for tracking uh, data and implementing participant surveys and questionnaires and to provide information and referral to other community resources that may become aware when we have that original meeting and uh, introduce them to town. In order to be successful, we're also going to need those five community partners. And so community partners need to come to the table with five stalls, a willingness to pilot the program and work with us, and a willingness to sign an agreement that gives the town of Canmore the authority to enforce the program and the program guidelines on private property. Uh, while working together. We also need bylaw services. Oops, I'm a little behind. I have that tendency. Sorry about that. Um, <laughs> we need to create a camping bylaw that prohibits overnight camping everywhere else in Cam or outside of designated areas such as campgrounds or the Safe Park program. And we're going to need bylaw services to actively enforce um, cam all other overnight camping situations that don't fall within that uh, new bylaw. Because the program operates also a large portion of the hours after the hours of our bylaw team, we are also going to include um, an evening night security. The role of them will be, of course, we call it a safe park program. So the safety of the participants in the program is paramount. So they will do at least two nightly loops through the lots to make sure that the, they aren't seeing anything suspicious or unsafe for participants in the program. They will also be reporting any um, sort of more minor violations such as there's a lawn chair left outside, things like that, uh, back to the program coordinator so they can be followed up with to ensure people are following those guidelines. They will also report any suspicious behavior uh, to our CEMP. Um, and if there's people parking in those places that aren't part of the program, they will track that license plate, let bylaw know first thing in the morning prior to the hours of operation before nine o'clock, bylaw will loop through um, to do enforcement if those vehicles that aren't part of the program are parking there. Um, and they will also have that license plate if they don't see them there, that if they see them around town to let them know about the program and direct them to become a participant of the program. We will also have some operational requirements. Uh, we've had a history the last few years of quite a bit of um, van um, dwellers finding out on the internet in various places to come to Canmore. And so I think we have a, a need for some timely communication to minimize the amount of enforcement required that we get this information out there of what, uh, what is happening in Canmore in the season of 2020 so that people are aware and uh, there's, there's less people having to be um, given warnings and directed to the program that they're going to arrive in town hopefully more aware that we have a safe park program and how to access that. We're going to need access to washroom facilities so we will be providing uh, porta potties to places where there is not access to washrooms as well as bear proof bins. Uh, signage is going to be huge as well so that people are clear 
when you're given a permit or uh, when the hours of operation that public parking isn't allowed in those particular spaces between that time and then people are in their assigned stalls. So there will be signage as well as numbered uh, requirements in the stalls in order to make this program successful. Continued data collection will be integral to both this program implementation this year as well as some of the longer term solutions as we look at who fit the program, what are our numbers, what was the program demand, as well as who didn't qualify. Who else do we have in town who maybe is van dwelling or is looking for somewhere to live but didn't meet the criteria of the program and we will track the, that data. We also want to understand if other housing options were available to people, what those were and why they uh, chose not to participate in those. Um, understanding the impact on enforcement and, and um, how we've communicated and did we get the word out there or is there other things we need to do to minimize enforcement and yet um, continue to make sure that it's actually being enforced. So there's a whole bunch of metrics and a whole bunch of, I think, important data to continue to collect. Uh, we've called this a pilot program. We want to have the opportunity to, um, to analyze that data, to look at that, and to keep the minimum um, sort of requirements we've said today in this year's program, but be able to tweak where need be, both into the future and uh, if there's minor tweaks that need to happen this year, that we're tracking the data and we understand what's going on to do the best possible solutions as as we move forward. So that's all I want to talk about in terms of the Safe Park program. But before I open it up for questions, I do just want to share a little bit with a possibility of a supplemental program to the Safe Park program. So um, this is sort of up in the air because the lease with Wapiti has yet to be confirmed that the province is continue to be interested in leasing us the land. Um, Mr. Como has been informed to a high degree of certainty that they are wishing to continue to lease to us. Um, however, there's one more ministry that needs to put their rubber stamp on that, and that is the uh, Ministry of Economic Development, Trade and Tourism. So uh, it, we've been informed that it's highly likely that that will happen. Uh, they are looking for market value lease. So Mr. Como, I believe if that comes through, will be coming to council in March to ask for that. Um, so those are the things that are kind of up in the air. If we are operating Wapiti as a municipal campground, the operators of that campground are interested in having a program that follows the same eligibility guidelines as our Safe Park program, and the Town of Camor uh, coordinator would continue to implement those eligibility, and then there would be 10 scattered sites at Wapiti that would be subsidized uh, a little bit higher price point than the, the parking stall with the $15 to $18 um, or night range. And the ongoing day-to-day -day operations would be managed by the Wapiti campground operators, not uh, by the Town of Canmore staff. Thanks very much for your presentation. <clears throat> Just on that last point, so it's good to hear that the province after years of trying, we're getting some response from them on the continuation of the Wapiti campground. Uh, so that is encouraging. If, if that were to close, we'd be in even more dire straits. So the, the process in the past to establish the fees to camp at Wapiti, what's the process been for that fee structure? Mr. Kamal? <coughs> Sorry, could you just repeat the So question? in the past, how have the fees been established for Wapiti? Is that something that the contractor at Wapiti establishes or the town or the province? Um, the contractor establishes the fees based on what is the, the current market rate um, throughout the valley for other similar campground. Okay, so the message that you pass along from the province was that they would be, um, well, it appears that they're on the verge of saying they'll extend the contract. They specified that they wanted to be sure the sites were renting at market rates, and that implies that they haven't been. Sorry, just to clarify, um, what, what, I, what, we're what we're referring to is, to this date, for the last 10 years, we haven't been charged 
by the province for leasing the lands. So that's less than market rate. So we're talking about the lease itself versus oh, okay. the, so the market rate for the users. For the land. Yeah. They so weren't talking about the camping fee rates. They were talking about our rate to use their land. Correct. Oh, I see. And that won't affect the, the overnight camping fees at Wapiti? Uh, no, uh, we administration will be coming forward in March um, with a, a recommendation for council, and at this point, we're asking that the municipality cover that market rate. So we can talk about that when you come back. But effectively, the town would be subsidizing the camping in that situation. Yes. Huh. Okay. Thank you. Um, I have a number of questions, as do others, I'm sure. So where to start? So some of the uh, recommended <coughs> locations were um, three, three groups or three identif identified locations in the parking immediately behind those buildings. So essentially 15 stalls within those two parking lots. Three, we're gonna, uh, the front side, the right. far side of Arts Place. Right. Yeah. All, but basically in the same yeah. essential location. Yeah. And, and yet uh, none in the parking area behind Main Street. Mm -hmm. So what was your, was that all around the um, access to public washroom? Yeah, so uh, originally that was one that was in the discussion as I was meeting with various town um, departments and folks. And um, the idea of a porta potty over there uh, in which we would need access to washrooms and then the public use it would have and the difficulty keeping it clean and maintained uh, as we have that bulk of flow when we have um, stalls here and washrooms here that uh, facilities is able to make accessible to the safe park program participants the decision was um, to not have a porta potty in the downtown core and to access uh, all of the 15 in this side uh, parking lot. I see. And uh, all of those um, people would be using, of course, the one public washroom, which is fairly constrained in, in the equipment. I mean, yes. there's one toilet and one urinal. And every, every lot will have one porta potty or access to right. a washroom. So the shower program that we have that exists uh, currently, and uh, in the past, very, uh, a lot of the vehicle dwellers have had membership at Elevation Place. They will continue to have their membership, and that will be a place where some showering happens and washrooms and hand washing mm -hmm. will happen um, for the overnight hours at right. the public washrooms. So presumably, then, town staff would be into the public washroom there pretty early in the day, and cleaning it for day use? Apparently they clean it overnight, uh, always. So uh, th we have yet to uh, decide exactly the access, whether it's going to be a code, whether it will be full public access, but facilities is uh, happy to have it open. We're just gonna look at the best possible way to do that and how they will do their cleaning cycle to make sure it's good for both um, evening and day use. Thank you. Councillor Sanford. <clears throat> Thank you, Mayor Barman. Um, I had a question about the eligibility criteria that you're going to use and um, how you're going to apply that. If somebody comes in mid-month and wants to um, be part of the program, say, on the 10th of, of the month, yeah. uh, so that only brings them up to the 15th, is that correct? Yeah, in order to maximize the time of the program coordinator, uh, if you come to join the program and you're, you are found to be eligible, you would uh, prove your employment and pay up until that next, either the 15th or the 30th, and then on that date, um, you would pay for your next two weeks and reprove your employment so that uh, they're not having to do this constant every day. There's 10 more people to try and send out messages or to track down or to do that piece. 
So yeah, you would do the four days up until the closest two week window and then every two weeks henceforward. So every, there's, there's gonna be a bi-monthly cycle, so mid-month and at the end of the month. Yeah. And each time people who have been determined eligible for the program uh, will have to also prove their employment. Yeah. And um, how do you prove employment in a situation like that? Primarily uh, current pay stubs. Okay. Yeah. Um, and those people, because they don't have a mailing address, they would get their pay stubs directly from their employer? Yeah, or they have them online. Oh, okay. Yeah. So they have access to that information yes. without having a postal address. Correct. Okay. Um, can I ask one more question? When uh, one of the statements in the report was that it would be for vehicles of a regular size, so that means that if you had a trailer with a vehicle attachment, um, this program wouldn't necessarily accommodate that? Yes. That, uh, if you had a trailer, like a, a tow behind, I don't think that this program would accommodate that in any way. However, um, fitting into a stall in the downtown core lot, you're looking at a van, not a motorhome. I, I believe, and my hope is, as we negotiate with private partners, some of those lots, which are uh, not for sort of daytime business, like Trinity Church, um, that we will be able to have motorhome sized and larger vehicles because this, there isn't that painted line stall issue that there is in some of the more um, commercial type of parking lot zones. So I, um, I hope we will negotiate that we have at least one lot that can have people who are dwelling in slightly larger vehicles than would fit into your standard parking stall. And that would be through a private um, Yes, none parking. of the current town lots. Okay. Yeah, fit that. Um, are we going to consider people who are self-employed in this program? Yeah, I think so. Um, it's harder to have a pay stub there, but I think to have private business, you need a business license. So if somebody shows us they have a business license and that they're operating in the town of Camor, then they certainly are eligible as employed individuals. Okay, thank you. Councillor Comfort. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Thank you for your presentation, Ms. Gilchrist. I have a question about, um, well, I have a couple of questions, but it's quite a, first of all, I have to compliment you on taking this on because it's quite the project and I can uh, see that you've done a ton of research and um, will have already learned lessons from the data we gathered last year and previous years and, um, and from other places. And so do you feel that you have sufficient capacity in your department to manage this? So, it, so I just anticipate that there may be some things that come at you sideways, so to speak, that you don't anticipate and you go, whoa, never thought of that in our discussions. <laughs> so I, I just wonder how nimble do you feel at, at getting the resources that you need to manage something that may come up? Uh, first, I would like to uh, give kudos to Travis Reynolds. Uh, yeah. I can't take all of the credit, most of that research, uh, and he really set uh, us up when he ended his contract to be very successful in coming forward with a nice model and design. So thank you so much for acknowledging that, and I would just like to pass that acknowledgement on. Uh, secondly, it, it, uh, if we didn't have additional resources, we wouldn't be able to within our department to handle the program. I do think with uh, the, the coordinator in place, and also FCSS has a little bit of um, wiggle room in the summer. A lot of the school programming that takes up um, a chunk of our time, we're in more of planning for the fall mode, and so we're um, a little bit more able to be immediately responsive because um, when you're planning and uh, designing things for the fall, you can be flexible versus I have to be in a classroom, I have a group going and things like that. So the fact that it lands at the time of year that it does, it gives us the opportunity to be a little more flexible and quickly adaptable to, um, to needs coming forward. Because I agree, I think we're going to have a few things come at us that we haven't yet thought about and that we're going to need to have some brainstorming sessions and say, okay, what do we do with this? Um, 
And I, I think that you're also, the lines of communication you set up with bylaw and all the other adjacent agencies are, seem to be excellent. Like everybody seems to be singing from the same songbook. I hate that expression. <laughs> but you know, you, you all seem to be um, in line with what's happening and um, I compliment you. And I, I wish every kind of success for the program because um, I think that everybody, not everybody, I think a number of people in Canmore were um, leery about a hobo camp establishing yourself of dirtbag climbers. Uh, it wasn't so bad back in the day, but it's not <laughs> what Camor is anymore. And there's still room for those people here and there. So um, I had a question about, um, um, so my Aunt Dorothy and Uncle Clarence who show up unannounced from time to time with their motor home, if they park somewhere would somebody knock on their door, like if they park somewhere because they get in late and they've driven all night and why do they do that when they're 90? I don't know, but you know. Um, but uh, would somebody knock on their door and say, um, you'll have to move in the morning or would they put a note on their windshield? Like how does that part work? I'll let Mr. Burt answer oh, okay. that one. They're nice late. people. Define late. Um, <laughs> I mean, generally when we encounter RVs that are on the street, uh, the first thing we do is we run the license plate to determine if it's parked in front of someone's house. Uh, if not, we would knock on the, the door and just have a conversation with them. Uh, as council is very well aware, we take an educational-based approach on pretty much everything we do. Uh, so if again, if it's your Aunt Dorothy and we're gonna have a conversation and say, you rolled in late, you're rolling out early, have a nice trip, next time you come, see if you can find some alternative parking. Great, thank you. Welcome. Thanks. Thanks. Councillor Mara. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Ms. Gilchrist. Um, I too appreciate all the work that you and your department have done and gone into and delved in. Um, I only have a couple questions, a couple have been answered. Um, it was curious to see that you, or there was indicated that there would, might not be any conflict or resistance in the parking in the downtown from businesses. I'm just curious if there's any consultation with arts place or um, any areas that would be affected like the mall or, or even at the golf course, because I know there is conflict already in the, I guess you would call it the north or south, the one that is between the golf course and the back of the arena, that there is already conflict there in the summer. Oh. So I was just curious if that was any when consulted in those areas. Uh, so after I had already written the staff report, I did uh, sit down with uh, Arts Place and um, had a conversation and they were happy with the design. They do have something at the end of September that uh, re makes a requirement for that front lot full use requirement. And so I assured him that as we vacate lots that we would make sure uh, in order to not interrupt the flow of their programs and services that we would uh, not have any safe park program there in that week uh, or really after that because we end uh, that week. Uh, I did not, I was not aware of conflict uh, with the golf course in terms of that back lot, mm -hmm. um, which is a separate lot, but there is that adjoining little piece yeah. with the golf course. I certainly could um, reach out. Uh, mm -hmm. And go, and go forward and, and just let them know and, and have conversation with any of their concerns if there's anything we need to mitigate. Um, but uh, I had not uh, reached out to the golf course. Okay, uh, just I was curious because too, there seems to be a verbal, because I've had conversations with both, um, a verbal agreement that they use each other's one in the winter, one in the summer, but in the summer there came to be where there's a lot of hockey camps and they tend to use that bark back parking lot because then there was trailers backing up overnight into the golf course so I just yeah. see a little bit of a conflict there yeah um, the other thing I was wondering about is how you're going to prioritize to what lot you use first and how you filter down where you're filling your spots and so that will be in consultation with both the private partners and uh, businesses connected. So like I said, Arts Place has mentioned a time which doesn't work necessarily for them. When I was um, chatting with facilities and, and about the back side of the rec center, mm -hmm. that was also brought forward that mm -hmm. it would be one of the early ones to not be used in the fall, okay. but is quite good for May and June. So um, it will be based, I, 
on that as well as I think if we end up with a spot where we can have some larger vehicles, we would like to keep that in the pool as long as possible mm -hmm. um, so that we can accommodate. Also, we will be talking to, you know, if there's things going on at um, churches or places that we end up in contract with to uh, design a system that meets people's needs. So you're sort of telling me it's sort of a fluid, you're it very is. flexible in moving if there's complaints or concerns that why did you pick this spot and not that spot and, it, and even yeah. in, within the parking lot? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. And so to address the conversation about the downtown business as well, mm -hmm. when I spoke with um, Beth, mm -hmm. uh, there had been a few people that have felt like uh, it's been happening for years and that they didn't have recourse. And so the feedback I was getting from her is people were just looking for uh, it to be regulated and controlled and to have this system and that, that they would be quite happy um, with the program and with the guidelines having people in the downtown core because now if it's not going well, there is some recourse versus um, them just being frustrated with people's fire pits in the middle of their parking lot or you know, setting up a, a camp. Uh, this way there is regulation and, um, and criteria attached. And so uh, it was more alleviating than here we go for another summer of having to deal with some sort of renegade behavior in the parking lots. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Councillor Seeley. Thank you, Mayor Borman, and thank you, Ms. Gilchrist, for the, the information. A very thorough job, and I'm, uh, I'm happy with uh, especially the scattering things. Uh, I think that'll be helpful. Uh, I'm also concerned about the rec center parking lot. It's very busy with the golf course, so I appreciate that you'll reach out to them and make sure that uh, uh, the approach is good. And uh, just wondering about after hours and uh, porta potties and, and things like that. What happens in the after hours when there's a problem? The public washrooms are being used and for some reason access uh, can't, uh, can't happen. Is there a contact number for them to call or some alternate arrangements that could be made? That is not something we have yet built into the plan, but we certainly can. Okay. <laughs> Things happen, right? So yeah. It's nice to, nice Absolutely. to be. Uh, and uh, the evening night nice security. I'm just wondering about if enhanced policing has been considered rather than hiring a company and keeping costs down for the program. Uh, we do have enhanced policing with the RCMP. Maybe that could be a, a starting point. Uh, just wondering if that's been considered. And uh, I appreciate bylaw uh, in the morning coming around checking things out. Yeah, it wasn't a huge consideration in that in the summer there is a lot going on, and if it would be a low priority. Um, and the security company isn't a huge cost necessarily. Um, because most of those companies are already contracted to be doing uh, that type of patrol with hotels. So it's just adding a few sites on for them um, to do that sort of more of a safety and prevention piece. Okay. Yeah. Thanks. Councillor Mara. Thank you. Um, I'm just curious on the time for the people exiting the spots. Um, and again, I'm looking at the downtown core um, and talking to a couple of people when their businesses, and I'm not saying the lo parts, lo uh, parking lot is full, but when you determine where the spots are, if they're close to a business like yoga or different spots that have early morning classes, um, was there consideration given into changing times for certain lots or it's just straight across the board, everyone has to be out by nine? straight across the board, but I think we can take some of those things into consideration when we choose the actual, actual stalls. Mm -hmm. Facilities is wanting to be involved in choosing which stalls, and so recognizing directly behind the yoga lounge might not be the best stalls within that um, particular parking lot. And I think um, that there is also data in wh what's full and when it, mm -hmm. where it's full mm -hmm. um, available that we can choose those stalls with a more educated um, system but trying to create uh, we won't have people always in the same stall either so that it becomes like a family because with too much comfort <laughs> um, becomes you know sort of a lax in terms of those guidelines so that each time you might be as every two weeks assigned with different people in a different stall 
I don't want to have to um, try to then say, oh, well, now that you're in this yeah. lot, it's mm -hmm. this time. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Keeping it standardized sort of keeps mm -hmm. that consistency for people to be able to adhere to the guidelines because most people want to. Thank you. May I ask two more questions? Mm -hmm. um, this is directed more at uh, bylaw. Um, I'm just curious when there was, in the last, um, last summer when we had that people had to be exited between seven and nine, were there people bordering that nine so that they weren't gone by nine? Like if you got there and they were holding it out to the last minute, five to nine before they left, or were they pretty good at leaving in that seven to nine, before seven, sorry. So it'd be the seven o'clock they were bordering. So generally we wouldn't arrive until about 7.15 or 7.20. Mm -hmm. Um, and the numbers varied from zero mm -hmm. to six or seven vehicles at a time. So again, some, some of the feedback I'd received from the van dwellers where I got in late, I didn't see the signs, I set my alarm, I didn't wake up, um, you know, I know I was supposed to be gone, but I slept in. But the majority of people were moving, and again, a bit of a different situation there, uh, where it was a no parking situation at seven o'clock in the morning. Uh, drastically different from what we're looking at now. Okay, thank you. Welcome. And one other question, this is back, uh, sorry. Um, a question that was asked to me is, um, in the re requirements or the criteria, is there a minimum amount of hours that they have to work? Um, like, could I just go and get a, jo a job and work four hours a week and uh, am I eligible for the pl program or is it's just... Uh, no. Uh, so, okay. yeah, there is a minimum hours. No, you can't get a job for okay. four hours and just okay. be a casual employee and refuse every shift you're offered. Okay. No, the intention would be that you're working at least 20 hours a week. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Councillor Hillstead. Thank you, Mayor Borman. Thank you uh, for the presentation. Um, with this being a pilot, um, and we're starting off with 50 stalls, um, are we looking to increase that, lower that after this year's data? Like, is it just going to be based strictly on the data or do we have a number in mind where we won't go past that? Or is it, how fluid is it? <laughs> not, the, well, the I think based on the 2019 numbers is why we settled on 50. Um, I think uh, with good data collection and as we move forward, we will find um, over the years alternate solutions as well based on that data that may divert people. I won't be looking to expand. I'll be looking to send information back to you guys and that decision being, do we go forward again with the same? This is what our numbers say. Are we looking, <clears throat> would we like, it was very successful, would we like to expand? Do we want to do some kind of a different program? Is there something we can be doing with staff of common business? Just, I think, um, as we look forward, this data collection may impact the numbers of this program, either um, by gaining more stalls or by declining based on how it runs, as well as some, some other, inform some other housing conversations and uh, solutions as the municipality goes forward. Thank you. Councillor Stanford. Thank you, Mayor Barman. Um, I was wondering about the parking stalls in front of Arts Place. And they have a number of programs in the evenings. So I'm, I'm considering either putting a motion on the floor to move the parking stalls to behind Arts Place, um, but that then brings all the the parking into these three parking lots. And because we are expecting all of the people who are parked downtown to use this public washroom versus Arts Place washroom, um, having them on this side of the building, I think would also facilitate that. So do you need a, a motion um, in that regard or is that something you could consider changing? Because I know that you have the parking areas already considered. Yeah. Um, the, the idea of having them on the other side is based on that scattered site. So it gives it a little bit more separation if there's five on that side. Um, but absolutely, I think if council, I don't know if you guys need a, a motion, because I think you do, because the recommendation says as presented. Yeah, there um, would have to be a motion. Amending, yeah, amending but the... if this panel thinks that it's better off on the other side, um, I am not um, firmly opposed 
to that. I think it does create more that there's 10, you know, sort of 15, all within eyesight and could be quite close proximity that sort of takes away that idea of the separation and, and adds a little bit perhaps more to a negative image of a collection of folks. Um, and I didn't hear from Arts Place any concern about being on that other side in terms of their evening events and patrons. So, um, you know, I, I guess if the shift wants to happen collectively, uh, I think that that's certainly possible. Okay. Well, the only, the only other consideration I would have of having the parking on the other side is that there are a number of residents also bordering that yep. lot versus the center lot. Mm -hmm. um, there, there are some residents on the other side of 10th Street, yep. but most of the buildings on the Main Street side bordering those parking lots are commercial. Mm -hmm. um, so we don't expect that people will be in those buildings overnight right. um, and they will arrive in the morning to do their, to, yep. to conduct their business downtown. Yep. So that, that would be my only consideration um, and perhaps I'll bring a motion forward with that. You didn't really um, talk very much about the budget um, in, in, the, in the report you did, but in your presentation, um, I just wanted to, I guess, reestablish that there was a budget of $110,000 for this program. Yes. And the, um, the recommended budget for implementation is $79,000? Yes. Yeah. So you're well, with, you're well under budget, and um, it's very creative uh, how you put the program together because um, the budget is well covered, and all these aspects of the budget are, um, are well within what was allocated, right? Yes. So, so yeah. um, I just wanted to clarify that because yeah. it's in the report, but we didn't see the presentation. So. Perfect. Thank you. Thanks. I had a question around the same um, line of thought as, as Councillor Sanford. In fact, we had a brief conversation about it, and uh, it'll be, um, I think, worthwhile to bring that motion forward to um, so Council can consider that question. Uh, I do have um, a couple of other questions. In the report, you uh, reference the uh, legal review of $3,000. Has that occurred yet? or? So they did a pre preliminary review of how, uh, what we would need to have both in our agreement with participants in terms of waiver of liability and some of those things, as well as what needs to be in the partner contracts in order for uh, bylaw services to um, enforce on private property and uh, to ensure that this program is not setting us up for any other legislative um, snags with the Innkeepers Act or resident tenancy. Uh, so we've gotten that preliminary piece. We will write those agreements prior to program launch and then it will go back to legal to ensure that um, we have all of our T's crossed and our I's dotted to uh, ensure that we are not leaving any private people in a situation of liability or leaving ourselves open to any uh, liability. Right, thank you. And, and specifically, uh, you noted the um, interest in, in reviewing whether the violation of the participant agreement is sufficient grounds for removal from the program. Is that part of the legal review that you've had? Yes, so one of the questions asked of the review is how do we remove somebody uh -huh. from the program and, uh, and, and get the right to do that on private property. And that's been vetted then? Yeah. Great. Um, certainly um, there's an assumption, I suppose, that, that I have and others will have uh, regarding bylaw enforcement. So. Um, Given this um, proposal, if it moves forward, I assume there'll be really strict enforcement by bylaw on the other, in the other parking, municipal parking areas in regards to the no parking hours. So that ties into uh, me coming back in March for a proposed campaign bylaw. So currently, just as a reminder, the, the traffic and road use bylaw restricts the parking of RVs on public streets, which includes public parking lots from midnight to 8 a.m. and lets it's parked 
directly in front of your home, then you can park it for a period of up to 36 hours. That only addresses RVs. So if it's a, I always use the example, if I'm in my Honda Civic and I've parked from midnight to 8 a.m., it's not an RV. So that's not the intent of that section. The intent of the section truly is to deal with RV storage. We do have a component in our parks bylaw which addresses municipal parks where it prohibits people from erecting, maintaining, occupying tents, shelters, etc. So that's where the gap in the program lies and that's why a camping bylaw will be brought forward in March to address camping throughout town. Um, and then it feeds into what we're talking about here. So we know that we'll have you know, up to 50 stalls where people will be approved. Without the other legislation, we won't be able to do enforcement. Why would you sign up for the program if you can park in the stall directly adjacent to the safe parking program? So absolutely, uh, if approved, we will be out. Generally, we start at 7.30 in the morning. Uh, we bump that up in the summer hours to 7 a.m., just like we did last summer actively out enforcing people camping in their vehicles, outside of vehicles. I attended to a call last year in between the gravel parking lot and elevation place in the little parklet uh, where there was a tent set up. So that was a bit of a challenge because it wasn't necessarily defined as a park. And again, like I said before, an educational based approach where primarily we'll be issuing warnings, we track the warnings, we provide information as to the safe parking program, where else you can go, uh, and then if we encounter those people again, then it becomes an enforcement or a fine action. Mm -hmm. So, and you said that'll be coming forward in May? March. March, March. Yes. Great, that's, that's good, thanks for sharing that. As long as you're at the podium, so, um, I think this is a, a really fulsome and creative approach to dealing with the issues that we've identified over the last couple of years and thank you to your team for doing this work. Uh, and I think it could help address a lot of the situation that we um, realized was occurring in regards to people that are actually working in Canmore and choosing to, to live in their vehicle for whatever reason. Uh, but with this program, and, and I know that that it's very difficult to address the other need. This program won't do that. Do you have any thoughts around how to manage the situation for people who are living in their vehicles, uh, perhaps on a temporary basis, but because that's their only option. They're not working. Maybe they'd like to be working, but they're not. They don't have, they can't afford a home Typically, those are the folks that fall between the cracks here. So, um, if you could share any thoughts in regards to that issue, that'd be helpful. I think this. we can we can probably both jump in on that that response. Uh, as a frontline officer, when we encounter those situations, we try and obtain as much information as possible, and then we provide referrals generally to our FCSS department. So we work in partnership with FCSS. Uh, we encourage people to attend FCSS to see what's available in the community. Um, and unfortunately, due to the, the nature and the size of the community, we can't offer every single support that's required for people. We do take a compassionate approach to that in terms of um, if someone needs a little bit more time to leave the community to attend a larger city center, to find a location for services, we'll work with them. Um, but there have been times, uh, recently we had a situation, an encounter where someone was in that situation, they were parked on a private parking lot, a uh, vehicle had broken down, etc. And we basically brokered uh, the conversation between the vehicle dweller and the business and the property owner to share with what was going on and see you know, and with FCSS, what sort of timeline could we give that's realistic, that's attainable, um, that works for both parties involved? Unfortunately, there are times where we do need to take the approach to say, this person hasn't reached out to FCSS, they're not looking for the resources. Some people don't want to go down that path, and it does become an enforcement component. That's really the last resort for us, um, but it does get to that point. I'll let Ms. Gilchrist answer further. Great, thanks for that. Yes. Yeah, we also are aware that we have some of those uh, folks in our community and 
Um, unfortunately, most services of a, of a nature that occasionally folks need are, they're not mandatory. Uh, and so we continue to support people, provide them with the information and referral and the services that we can, um, but we can't necessarily mandate someone to participate. So we also continue to do that type of support. We currently have somebody who is van dwelling and um, is in quite a financial situation that we've discovered hasn't done taxes for 10 years. So they have a lot of money coming back to them. And so um, Mavis has just done for a couple, 10 years worth of taxes. So those are the types of things that we can sometimes support with mm. to help them get on their feet and to get some other solutions is we bring them in, find out what's going on, and then provide the services that we can and the support and relationship that we can that they can always come back. Um, and then we make referrals and hope that they want to access the services that are available either in the valley or outside of the valley. Okay, thank you. Yeah. I mean, it's good to know that we're paying a lot of attention to that and have uh, responses in hand and, and responses we've used in the past that have uh, by and large been successful. It's important that we continue to uh, show compassion to people in the community that are struggling in that way. So appreciate the work that FCS is doing and, and bylaws approach. Councillor Seeley. I'm just wondering about how the hours were selected, 8 p.m. till 9 a.m. Has this worked in other communities? And uh, uh, I know it's a pilot program, so there's some flexibility, but can you talk about those? Uh, yeah, it was based on, on research, um, doing those type of hours. A lot of safe park programs um, that the original design was from is intended for homelessness um, along sort of the west coast of the United States. Um, and so we've kind of tweaked that for less of a homelessness response as a seasonal worker um, type of response. But uh, those hours or something within that vicinity, an hour either side of that, uh, are fairly standard across uh, research in safe park programs. And I guess I'm concerned about the 8 p.m. start, what that means for dinner time and, and things like that. It maybe should be a little bit earlier. 9 o'clock certainly works as a time to, to vacate, but mm -hmm. uh, a little concerned about the 8 p.m. be interesting to see how it plays out. Thank you. Yeah. Councillor Comfort. Thank you. Um, <clears throat> I had a question about um, Wapiti. There's um, toward the end of the council notes for this presentation, um, it says Public Works discussed potential of a subsidized camping service at Wapiti that had the same eligibility as Safe Park pro pro Program. I understand that the, the, progr the contract with the province hasn't been negotiated yet. Yeah. And, and hopefully it will happen in time to make this um, useful to those people. Yeah. Um, and I was wondering, does Wapiti have more amenities than parking lots would have for those, the people that so they get more for their money. Yes, so um, the safe park program would be at the price point of $10 a stall, and it's literally parking and a parking stall. The Wapiti program would be a separate program because it's actually subsidized camping. It's not safe parking. So you would be able to unload your vehicle and have a, a campfire and access the washrooms and shower facilities. And that would be for people who are choosing to camp um, versus the more sort of van life um, type of situation that the parking safe park program would um, be appealing to. Uh, and it would be 15 to $18 per night. So a significantly uh, higher point of uh, price point than the parking safe park program. And one of the benefits I imagine is that you could stay in the same spot and not have to move. Correct. And that's a big benefit for someone who's here as a true seasonal worker, like over the summer or whatever. For certain people, yeah. yeah. Like yeah. I think some people are looking to camp and some people are looking for sort of this van life idea. And a lot of the van life is about parking at Walmart or, par or parking in a parking stall. And so it's a slightly different adventure and it's, it's just slightly different of what they're looking for. I would love to be able to offer both options. And uh, so if the lease agreement goes through, the operators are amenable to, um, to doing that. And because the criteria would be the same, uh, there isn't a lot of negotiation, I don't think, required in order to implement. If we go with the season of 2020 of Wapiti, I believe there will be time in order to implement this subsidized camping as well. Yeah, and that might take off some of the pressure on 
some people have expressed a bit of um, concern or um, worry about um, Arts Place parking lot, for instance, presumably because it's so central. Yes. Um, it's a very desirable location. Um, and I think that uh, that's warranted. Um, I have something else. I can't read my own writing. <laughs> um, oh, uh, so if you're going to make changes to locations or that sort of thing, can you can we do that internally administratively, or does this have to come back to council for a, a council motion? I'm just wondering about that process. Uh, so my feeling would be, uh, in terms of location um, from municipal lots, that that would need to come back to council, and that is will be approved today. And we won't look to make changes uh, in this season. That we will pilot if there's concerns, we will accept those concerns and explain that this is a pilot and we hear you and, and if we go forward next year and, and this is not was the wrong choice, we won't carry on with it uh, going forward. I didn't give super amounts of details into some of the operations, um, but just sort of the high level criteria so that if there's tweaking required, we can do that administratively without it being changing the integrity of the program and what uh, this council has voted to. So in terms of the general outlines, like you're, you've talked about a priority on different lots yeah. and when you would open certain things up, those are, once we, if we pass this, accept this plan, then that's going to be operational. Yeah, operational. But that will be, that's, that being said, that if there was some huge concern or huge unforeseen issue, you would address that? Absolutely. Okay. Of course you would. You're FCSS. <laughs> Thank you very much. Did you have something? No. Council Mayor? <laughs> One last question. I'm just concerned about, um, not necessarily concerned, but would like an answer um, regarding spillover. We, we talked about spillover for when we implement the parking program downtown, and not necessarily about downtown, but with this, um, if the bylaw, if this goes through and the bylaw goes through, what supports or um, rights or however it works for private parking lots that are having now people are coming in don't want to pay the ten dollars they are staying overnight in somebody's parking lot like a private parking lot what would be our so a couple thoughts uh, we didn't see that happen very often last year so okay. my feeling is with bringing in a safe parking program mm -hmm. that will decrease mm -hmm. uh, that from occurring and the traffic and road use bylaw will be coming back before council uh, tentatively in March as well to address the paid parking component mm -hmm. and we will also be creating a section for enforcement on private property so right now if you have a vehicle that's parked in your property you contact our department we can come down we can tow the vehicle if needed but we don't have an enforcement mechanism to issue a ticket so that's going to be another component of the traffic and road use bylaw. But from my opinion, that's a really low risk of spillover from private, from public lots into private lots. Uh, my feeling would be the spillover would occur from the public lot into a public parking stall. So if stall okay. number one, two, three, four, and five are taken and uh, the van dwellers have made some friends, we'll just come park in stall number six or seven. Mm -hmm. But that also feeds into the private security company and the feedback back to bylaw services, early starts, et cetera. Okay. My, my concern is based on um, where I work out of, uh, out of the downtown core is that we have a parking lot that is shared between businesses and there was overflow coming into that parking lot. So it's pretty much just left, like uh, leave a note and say this is not parking and you sort of have to chase them around the parking lot so they would just call you and say this is an issue record the license plate and then there would be support for them so moving forward like i said with the traffic and road use mm -hmm. bylaw amendment for the authority to do enforcement on private property mm -hmm. We would still encourage private property owners to try and address the parking situation themselves through clear and adequate signage, uh, issuing notes, warning notices, mm -hmm. etc. And if that wasn't successful, we would be able to provide some assistance. Thank you. You're welcome. Councillor Sanford. Thank you, Mayor Barman. Um, when we're going to transition from we, we, we've spent three summers now trying to, you know, work out programming 
uh, to accommodate people in the community in vans. So this summer we're transitioning from the program we had last summer where people parked at Elevation Place and, and the Panhandle. Are we gonna have to um, in, improve or increase the signage there to indicate that there is no overnight parking, um, that now we're into a different program? Short answer, yes. <laughs> okay. Because <laughs> people will expect what happened last summer to happen this summer if they're not up to speed, so we'll bolster that information for them. Okay. Um, during the data collection of the previous program, people did indicate that if there was a safe parking program, they would be willing to pay for it. Yes. Is that correct? Yeah. So um, the whole program has been fashioned or shaped around that intake of information that suggested that a paid program would be desirable if people knew exactly what the parameters were and that they would park in a place that was safe for them um, yep. overnight. Yes. So the paid portion of this program is something that was in fact supported by the data collected? Correct, yeah. Okay, great, thank you. I don't know further questions from members of council at this time. Just before we move into the uh, motion, I, I just want to make an observation that um, particularly around communications, public messaging, so given that, that we'll be rolling this out at the same time as we'll be initiating paid parking downtown, I think it's going to behoove us to be really brilliant in our messaging and communication. So. Um, I have no doubt there'll be some uh, angst in the community about both those initiatives rolling out at the same time. Um, with that, I will move the council approve the implementation of the Safe Park Pilot Program as presented, as presented for the 2020 season, beginning May 4th and cl concluding October the 2nd. I believe you have an amending motion, Councillor Sanford. There you go. Well, preferably. Okay. Uh, since there are five locations that have been identified, uh, one of them being in front of Arts Place, I would like to amend the recommendation to be at the back of the Arts Place building. So effectively the five stalls are proposed to be in the front of the Arts Place parking area would be in behind the building. Yes, that's what I'd like to um, uh, move as an amendment. Did you want to speak to that? Well, um, the considerations that, that I would have are about the mixed use of that parking lot during Arts Place programming um, because they do use that parking lot in the evening. And if we have patrons that are trying to come to programming and that parking lot is filling up um, at the front, then it limits the access for those patrons. However, in the evening, uh, if, if those uh, units were on the back side of the building, I mean, people park all around that area, so it's not that um, big of an impact. But also the, the fact that there are residences uh, in surrounding that parking lot, I think it would be better to keep the parking behind Arts Place and also to encourage the washroom use to be at the public washrooms that the, that, that whole parking lot would be sharing. So that would be my rationale for making that amendment. Now I'll support your amending motion, Councillor. I, I, I agree with your assessment that, firstly, the visual impact of the parking area in front of Arts Place is more um, dramatic, if you will. It's um, uh, facing 8th Avenue, so a lot more traffic, and uh, it's also facing um, two or three residential properties whereas uh, immediately behind the building, uh, it would be less, um, less, in your, less in your face, if you will. So I'll support your amending motion. Councillor Hillstead. 
I won't be able to support this amending motion as I feel that the whole point of this is to have scattered sites. Um, and this kind of defeats that purpose because now you'll have 15 of the 25 stalls clumped in a much closer proximity. Um, so I think the way that this program set out now is how it should go because they've done a lot of research into it and I don't see it being an issue as they've already talked with Arts Place and they don't seem to see it being an issue. And also this program's fluid so there's a good chance that, you know, through just administration they will go and not fill up those stalls first. They can, you know, those can be the last five potentially because it's a fluid situation right now. Um, so it may be that they don't even need those five stalls. So to me, I think you leave them as it is, as the scattered site makes sense to me and this, I feel, this defeats that purpose. Further discussion on the amending motion? Councillor Seely. Yeah, I'm uh, struggling with this a little bit, but I, I think I will support the, the amending motion. I do like the scattered approach, but uh, I think the residential component of being in front of Arts Place uh, outweighs that for me. So it is a pilot program, so we can see how it goes, but uh, I think I, I, I will support. Councillor Mara. I too will support this motion. I just feel that that lot is, um, has a higher potential or is a higher use at night than the rest of the back parking lot. So for that reason, I will support this. For the discussion, see no other discussion on the amending motion from Councillor Sanford. I'll call the question, those in favor, opposed? Motions carried with Councillors Comfort and Hillstead in opposition. Back then to the main motion as amended, which is the council approved the implementation of a safe park pilot program now as amended for the 2020 season beginning May 4th and concluding October 2nd. Councillor Sanford. Um, well, I would be happy to support this motion in the sense that um, this is our third year of moving through um, dealing with summer parking and um, I know that administration has done a lot of work and there's been a lot of data collection. Um, the report itself really shows how much uh, internal discussion has been with the town and we know that there are, are issues that we need to address in the community. We have tried other mechanisms to address them and the safe parking program seems like a good evolution of how to accommodate people who are employed in the in the community for the summer in these vehicles but also um, it addresses that need to have recreational camping done more appropriately in campground areas so this I think determines who needs that opportunity and there are some good strategies to accommodate that and I would be happy to support the way that it's presented. So thank you for all your work. It's been very good. I'll support the motion as well and, and also note appreciation for the, the work that's been done uh, to inform this report and, and last year's work as well. It, it's a, it is a very difficult situation, not only for our community, but a number of uh, similar communities. I'd had several conversations last year with uh, representatives from other communities uh, like Squamish for instance and uh, uh, American mountain towns uh, that have the same sort of uh, tendency to, to attract people that are looking for an adventure by sleeping in their vehicle or whatever and uh, by and large the people I spoke with in those other locales uh, acknowledged that, that <coughs> how Canmore was addressing this shared problem uh, was um, inspiring them towards similar sorts of approaches. So, uh, A, I'm really happy that, that our administration has taken on this challenge and come up with uh, a really positive uh, approach. And B, I recognize that um, I recognize that Canmore is, is helping to set some uh, new standards, if you will, for other mountain towns and, and resort municipalities that are addressing very similar uh, issues. 
So at this time, I'll be quite happy to support the uh, motion. Councillor Mara. Thank you, Mayor Borman. I'm, I will support this um, motion. I'm also looking to make an amending motion. Do I do that after or no? Right now. Right now, okay. <laughs> <laughs> so I would like to make a motion to um, amend the, um, to move safe parking stalls from the back north parking lot to the south at the recreation parking cent location. So the reason that I'm making this motion be is because I know that there already is some friendly um, resistance in that area um, with each other. Um, I would like them uh, to make it, uh, uh, the reason for moving it is because it's a high use area. Um, we still have construction in that area, it should be gone by then. But because they sort of have an agreement already, it's high use and there is a little bit of tension, I just feel that it would relieve any tension if we moved it to the south parking lot. What? Ms. Hyde, it's kind of blurry. Oh. <laughs> Ms. Hyde. Yeah. Sorry, it's kind of blurry. Oh, sorry. Still blurry. Yeah. There, oh, there we go. Thank you. Anybody speaking to that uh, amending motion? Councillor Comfort. So I'd need a map to know what this is exactly. <laughs> <laughs> I'm very directionally challenged. So back door to front door. Back door, so move it to the, from the, move it from the back, which is the, where the golf course, when you okay. drive, it's behind the skate. Where the ice machine, or the Zamboni dumps its ice? Yes, correct. Okay, so move it from there to the front yes. side. Okay. Yep, I think I can support that, because uh, school's out by then, right? Mm -hmm. mm, plus or minus, yeah. Two no, school. school's not in. This, right, this it starts May, yeah. Goes through till October. Right. Um, Give it a thought. Okay, well, because it's only five spaces, mm -hmm. it doesn't seem like it's, it doesn't seem like it should be an issue. Like, I don't think that's the issue. Maybe I'm wrong. Well, you keep thinking about it. Okay. Councillor Seeley. Yeah, I'll, I'll support this. I've got similar concerns. I think that uh, back area is quite busy, uh, golfing and, uh, and hockey and recreation in general. It's a small lot. Uh, the front lot's a lot larger and uh, would probably work, uh, work better. Is there any other discussion on the amending motion? Councillor Comfort? Uh, I have a question. So where, where would the facilities be for people to use in that location? Would they be in the rec centre? Or... Would there be a porta potty there? Do we porta know? Potty. Um, so the back side of the rec center was chosen, uh, A, because it would be a porta potty and uh, it's a little more hidden or could be up against the side of the building on the back side. We also did consider that of the five months the program sort of goes, May through, or yeah, May, June, and September would all have students. Um, starting school at 8.30 in the morning. So having it on the side where it's the student parking lot as well, uh, it didn't seem like as great of an idea. Um, so the back side was chosen because of school and uh, the porta potty and access to the porta potty and the hours of operation, both of the golf course. So by eight o'clock at night where people are arriving, they're, you know, we're gonna have um, daylight for another couple of hours. There is significantly less people still at the golf course other than when they're having events um, than sort of other timing of the day. So uh, it, it felt like it was the right decision, but that's just the background rationale and, and that's where the access to washrooms would be. Thank you. Yeah. Councillor Seeley. Thank you for that. And with that uh, explanation, I, I think I'll uh, not support this amendment and uh, go with the original. It is a pilot program, so we'll have lessons learned for sure. Councillor Sanford. Um, I don't think I can support this amendment just from the perspective of, again, putting the parking activity at the front of the building. I mean, there's also 
summer activities that uh, happen there with um, the summer camps and the programs. I mean, there's a lot of people coming and going through the front side of that building. Plus, I know that the uh, parking for the school overflows into the recreation parking lot during school times. The parking for golfing probably does overflow into the uh, recreation parking lot as well, but the, the parking lot at the um, golf course is very large. Uh, I don't often go there, but I think putting the parking in the recreation back lot to me makes more sense uh, just from the perspective of, of the number of people that come and go. And also I think the access to the building is easier from the back lot for people that would be using the washrooms in the building. So I won't support this amendment. Any other discussion on Councillor Mayor's amending motion? See none, I'll call the question. Those in favor? Opposed? Motions defeated with Councillor Mayor in support. So we're back to the main motion then as was uh, amended by Councillor Sanford. Uh, some of us have um, spoken to that main motion. Is there other discussion on the primary motion as amended? Seeing none, I'll call the question. Those in favor? Opposed? Motions carried unanimously. Thank you for all your work. I look forward to seeing bylaw back here in March. So there's a suggestion uh, that council take our usual break, is, which is a little bit later in the meeting now, because this next item may take a while. So does council prefer to do that? Sure. Nod? Okay, so we'll take a 10-minute break. We'll start again at 10.30.
So I'll call the meeting back to order. And we'll move on to item H2, the heli heliport lease renewal. Mr. Hannes. Good morning, Mr. Mayor and members of council. My name is Stephen Hannes, manager of facilities. Can you, just one sec, can people hear Stephen? My name is Stephen Hannes, manager of facilities. As well as overseeing all of the town's facilities, I'm responsible for the town of Canmore's many leases. Today I'm here to get council's direction on the proposed process for the upcoming Heliport lease renewal. To provide you with some background, the Heliport was constructed by the province of Alberta in the mid-1980s. The land is now owned by the town of Canmore and is leased to the Alpine helicopters. A wide variety of services are provided from the heliport. Some examples include landing and fuel services for, he for any helicopter company in the Bow Valley, as well as sightseeing flights, heli hiking, filming, forest fire suppression, mountain rescue, avalanche control, Transalta power line inspections, and backcountry lodge support. The current lease allows a maximum of 60 flights to be flown for sightseeing purposes between the hours of 8.30 a.m. and 5 p.m. In addition, uh, between 8 a.m. and 5 p.m. commercial flights are per permitted and as well as emergency flights during daylight hours. The heliport lease term ends November 30th, 2021. Section 403 of the current lease between the town of Canmore and Alpine Helicopters provides an option to renew the lease and it, re and it reads, Either the landlord or the tenant shall have the option to request an extension of the initial term for mutually agreeable period to be no longer than an additional 10 years by providing the opposing party at least 18 months advance written request prior to the end of the initial term. In the event the parties exercising this option, the parties shall enter into an amending agreement to reflect the renewal terms. Simply put, Alpine Helicopters has made a request to renew the lease for an additional 10 years. And so the lease shall be renewed. Mr. Hannes, I'm sorry, do you want us to let you deliver your full report before asking questions or do you want, would you entertain yeah, Feel questions? free to ask questions if you feel, if you feel a need. Okay, if, if it won't interrupt your flow of thought. Okay. The, just to that point, um, the Section 403 is, is pretty clear that um, uh, it, it references the maximum or an additional 10 years, no longer than an additional 10 years, but doesn't reference um, a minimum number of years that, that could be negotiated. That's correct. Right. So 10 is the maximum, but it arguably could be a shorter lease negotiated. Correct. Thank you. So although the, the lease at this point shall be renewed based on the request uh, to renew from Alpine Helicopters, the terms um, are still to be negotiated. So at this time, we, we'd like to acknowledge an error that was made last year. Originally, the, t the lease was interpreted to have great, greater flexibility in determining whether or not to renew the heliport lease. And there was a call for a broader public input into this discussion. When we thought that this was the case, we anticipated a decision on renewal would, would need to have been made by or before May of this year. This is not in fact the case and we apologize for that confusion and miscommunication. I would like to take this time to address a concern that we've heard from some of the members of the public um, that we missed a deadline or made decisions without council direction. As I just explained, there is no longer any rush to make a decision before May. And there, and there will be a time for stakeholders to provide input um, over the coming months, once council provides their direction from today. So while we are not looking at whether or not the lease will be renewed, we are looking for input as to what that lease renewal would look like. I'd like to note that typically we do not obtain public input about the operations of private business prior to lease renewal. However, some residents have raised concerns primarily related to helicopter noise in close proximity to residential areas. 
Alpine Helicopters recognizes there are issues that with noise and have been working with us on solutions. They will provide us with some data to help inform council's decision in terms on these terms, on the terms of the lease to help mitigate the noise. On March 17th, Alpine Helicopters plans to present to council as a delegation. In the meantime, we have a Hellport monitoring committee. The purpose of the committee as per the bylaw is to monitor and review the business operations conducted by Alpine Helicopters in accordance with Schedule D of the lease agreement. It is within their authority to review the nature of complaints regarding the operations of the heliport and recommend changes to the, to the section of the lease that guides and, con that guides and conduct, the conduct of the heliport business. For administration and council to appropriately negotiate the terms of the lease, the heliport monitoring committee is well positioned to meet with stakeholder groups to better understand stakeholder perspectives regarding the lease renewal. We believe there are benefits for the committee to hear the feedback directly from the stakeholders themselves. So what parts of the lease might be open for discussion as part of the renewal? Schedule D contains the business operations, such as sightseeing, commercial operations, as well as flight departure and, and approach paths. In addition, administration would like to review some of the other terms of the lease, including renewal and termination clauses, the lease rate, and other administration and legal updates. So what's next? If council directs administration to proceed, we will be working with the Heliport Monitoring Committee to finalize the engagement schedule. So please note these timelines are preliminary and may change based on the availability of the committee and stakeholders. So in March and in April, the committee could start meeting with stakeholders. Then in March 17th, Alpine Helicopters will be a delegation at the Committee of the Whole. In May and June, the committee would consolidate the stakeholder feedback and provide it to administration for review. Starting in September and working through April 2021, administration will use the stakeholder feedback to conduct lease negotiations. Lastly, by May 2021, administration could return to council with recommendations regarding the terms of the lease. Both the facilities and communications departments will support the Heliport Monitoring Committee in leading stakeholder discussions. A web page has been created to provide information to the, to the interested parties and will be updated as we have more information and updated timelines. That website is www.camor.ca forward slash heliport. In addition, an email has been set up called, uh, at heliport at camor.ca, where feedback can be submitted. Before presenting the recommendations of their support, I would like to open up the field uh, to any questions that you may have. Thank you very much. Um, don't know where to start exactly. So, in regards to the suggestion that uh, council appoint or delegate the heliport monitoring committee to meet with specific identified uh, I'm getting a note here what's that the mic is on someone oh. requests to speak oh, right. okay. um <laughs> thanks for interrupting the um, suggestion that the Heliport Monitoring Committee be designated to engage with identified uh, stakeholder groups, and, and there's specific groups that you've identified, including the uh, Hel Heliport Alliance Committee, can't remember your name, sorry, um, uh, and other groups such as uh, BOTA and TCK, CHLA, Chamber of Commerce, and all of those, right. So I'm curious about uh, your vision for the role of the Alpine helicopter rep that sits on that committee in those engagements. And then uh, the role of, of the Alpine rep in, if any, in, in helping to formulate the, your recommendations to council afterwards. And I'll, I'll note that I, I see value in having 
a rep from Alpine at those um, engagement sessions with the various groups in the uh, to be able to order uh, in, in, to be able to answer questions about the operation of Alpine. Um, but I'm a little bit iffy on the role of the Alpine rep outside of that part of the process. So just share with me. Sure. Yeah. So the Alpine uh, representative um, at the table during the, the engagement process would be like the other committee members to listen, help listen, and record, and, and help consolidate the information. So with support from the town of Canmore, uh, myself, and communications. So they are there as any other member to, to listen and, and uh, field any questions and, and fact check any information, um, provide that feedback um, at the time, but mainly to listen and consolidate the information. Once that information has been consolidated by the, uh, the, the committee overall, um, that would be presented to administration. Their role on that committee and that the committee's purpose at that point, uh, we see would conclude somewhat at that point. At that point becomes a negotiation with the town and Alpine helicopters. So when it comes to you in your role with the town of Canmore formulating recommendations for council, that'll be your work uh, That would solely. be my role, yes. Right, and, and so you will have heard the discussions at these uh, engagements. And you wouldn't be looking for support from the Alpine rep to create your recommendations? Uh, no, that, that would be um, uh, a negotiation at that time. Um, and so there would be a, a, a back and forth uh, set of negotiations that we'd, we would uh, work toward a mutually agreeable uh, set of terms that would be uh, forwarded to council for, okay. uh, for final Great. approval. Thank you. And in regards to Schedule D, uh, when it does come to Council, and, and admittedly, um, Schedule D is, is the meat of, of the lease in many ways, what are your expectations or what's, what's Council's, what options would Council have when Schedule D comes forward for, um, for a discussion? I mean, would, if council were to direct changes to the, your proposed Schedule D, then you would take that back to Alpine and, and negotiate the changes? That's correct. Right, so council will have the authority ultimately to make those uh, decisions as a body on uh, the terms of Schedule D. That's correct. Okay. Councilor Hillstead. Thank you, Mayor Borman. Thank you, Mr. Hannes. Um, I have a couple of questions. Uh, first off, uh, basically the committee is just providing a what we heard report, essentially, Correct. to administration for them to go take into their lease or to the negotiations. Um, with that, uh, how can others in the community, like either like you've said there's going to be the website and the uh, email address, but is there opportunity for others in the community to come and meet with the committee to give their perspective? So this has not been uh, fully formulated by, um, uh, the process has not been formulated uh, at this point. Um, and so um, that would be a discussion with the Heliport Monitoring Committee. So certainly um, the, the website and the email um, that have been set up uh, will be one avenue. Uh, if there will be more opportunities, then, then the Heliport Committee will, will help, uh, will uh, inform that. Yep. Um, and then how many leases normally come before council? Uh, none in memory. Okay, so this is a huge exception to this norm? This is an exception, correct. I recall other leases coming to council, but I won't get into that. I'm certain this lease was before council for approval in 2010. Um, Councillor McCallum's not here to, to verify that memory, but we we're both on council and I recall council having the final say on, on the terms of the lease. Regardless, it is what it is. The, I, I would argue this lease is quite significantly uh, different in nature than most of the leases the town negotiates with um, businesses like Volker Stevin and Arts Place and the, on the Union Hall. Can't think of any other really substantive leases that are negotiated that may 
um, may reflect on, on or impact on uh, residents. But we can talk about that a little bit later as well. I've got more questions, but I'll let other councillors go. I'll, I got a few, so. Councillor Sanford. Thank you, Mayor Borman. Uh, thank you, Mr. Hannes, for your presentation. I understand that um, Alpine has a secondary staging uh, location now, or a secondary uh, tourist uh, flight center out on Morley. Is that correct? Uh, it's in the Stony Coda um, uh, by the casino. Okay. So when this, when this lease was first negotiated, they did not have that. Is that correct? That is correct. And so as we go into a second negotiation, um, how will their operation be reflecting that new opportunity that they have for tourist flights? Already Alpine Helicopters has been uh, uh, shifting uh, the majority of their 12-minute flights, their short flights, um, over to Stony Nakoda location. Um, and so the details of how that might impact Schedule D will, will, will be forthcoming through the process. And so that new opportunity on their, on their business model will be reflected in, in a new lease negotiation. Yes, we have to uh, be mindful that um, this is a separate lease agreement, um, and so and their le their lease over at Stony Nakoda is with an entirely different entity. So um, we would have to focus on what the terms of this lease are, um, independent of what's happening over at Stony Nakoda. Right now, they can um, benefit from moving their 12-minute flights over there, um, and if it's spelled out, uh, say in this Schedule D. Um, then it would, it would have to stay uh, regardless of what happens um, in the lease over in Stony Dakota local location. Right. But what I'm, what I'm trying to get at is if this lease is amended, their operation still has more than one uh, location to do they have some of the same elsewhere, activities. They have correct. Right. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Yeah, in, along the same lines, uh, Councillor Sanford is... is where your mind is, is going, I think, uh, I do have a number of um, questions that I, I'd like to just provide for, for your information. So in the future, when you're, you're gathering the information, uh, you'll have um, an opportunity to gather the information and answer some of these questions and, and what you are leading towards, Councillor, is one of them. And um, so just for those future discussions, uh, I would like to have the... Uh, an understanding of the number of tourist flights, uh, including a breakdown of the type of the tour, the duration, um, commercial flights and rescue flights in 2019. And I know that this data is always provided by Alpine helicopters at some point, but it'll be important that, that um, we have that information. And I'm also would be looking for uh, an, ana an analysis of the changes to those numbers, uh, if any, uh, since the current lease was signed. So what has changed in, in the way of the delivery of the various types of flights, commercial and uh, rescue, and certainly the visitor flights? And uh, to, to Councillor Sanford's point, I'd be looking for a breakdown of, on the tourist flights that uh, flew out of the Camor Heliport uh, versus the pad at Stony Nakoda in 2019, recalling the um, the intent stated by Alpine to shift a lot of their um, short flights, at least, and some of their longer flights to Stony Nakoda. And another uh, piece of information that, that would help me in, in future decision-making is um, understanding the point of origin uh, of the visitors that are taking the visitor flights. I don't mean what country they come from or whatever, but are they visitors? Are they tourists staying here at hotels in Canmore? Are they tourists or visitors staying at the hotels in Banff or Kananaskis? Or are they visitors, day visitors coming out from the city? Um, so, so those are some of the pieces of information that, that I'll be looking for. And, I'm sure the rest of the council would be um, looking for some of that information as well. Uh, I have other thoughts, but I'll move on to Councillor Hillstead at this time. Thank you, Mayor Borman. 
Um, <clears throat> so with the heliport, that is municipally owned, controlled, but our airspace, we have no control over who flies in our airspace, correct? That's correct. There's other operators uh, in the Bow Valley. Okay. Because um, like, like, I know STARS flies through, I've seen military, but private people can, if they have, a, for some reason, have a private helicopter, <laughs> they can just bomb around with, as long as they have permission from other levels of government. There's, uh, there's higher order of uh, regulations, um, um, reg you know, Canadian uh, air regulations, um, uh, visual flight rules and those kinds of things, um, Ministry of Transportation, that they have to follow those rules. Um, and then you said the heliport was built uh, by the province in the 80s, so all the residential area across the highway from the heliport came after the heliport was built, correct? N most of it. Most of it. Yeah, like, I know just, Grotto was yeah. 90. It was, it was already under construction, some parts of Cougar Creek and yeah. other areas, but it was early days for, for that subdivision. Just trying to get my order of things in my mind, yep. so thank you. Councillor Sanford. Thank you, Mayor Barman. Um, I'm just looking at Schedule B and the, the uh, depreciation schedule. So it appears that um, Alpine Helicopters built some infrastructure on that site. They Correct. They built the blue building uh, and then they also built the log building. Correct. So they, they put those leasehold improvements in themselves at their expense, correct? Correct. Um, and according to the depreciation schedule, those assets are fully depreciated on that side? By the end of the term. By, by 2021, yeah. So the, that was the direction that they chose to do those leasehold improvements uh, or to add those those pieces of infrastructure, and then, according to the depreciation schedule, they're completely depreciated by the end of twenty one. That's twenty twenty one. So, in the sense that somebody does a leasehold improvement when it's fully depreciated, then they don't expect to derive value from that at the end of a lease if the lease is terminated, for instance. We wouldn't owe them anything because it's that, fully depreciated? That's depreciated. correct. If we, if we terminated the lease <coughs> prior to the natural termination, uh, right. it would be expected that we would actually have to pay them a certain amount. Okay. But with the fact, the fact that those assets are fully depreciated, um, the town would not owe them any um, leasehold improvement cost because of the depreciation schedule showing it's fully depreciated. That's correct. Okay. Thanks. Councillor Comfort. Um, thank you. Uh, my question also has to do with depreciation. I just wondered whether an adjustment was made because they, substan they suffered substantial damage during the flood of 2013, and I wonder if they had upgraded or amended their uh, valuation of their property, because I know that they, there were extra things put in, I believe, at the time of the rebuilding and, and uh, covering them in insurance. <coughs> Uh, upgrades were made. I, I know there's a, a significant civil damage um, to the site. Not 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 entirely entirely sure how much uh, above grade damage there they sustained at the time. I thought it was quite a bit, as me memory serves, but or doesn't, as the case wouldn't, may be. Wouldn't that have been compensated for um, through the FCRP or whatever it was called, the Fricks. flood recovery, Fricks? That's my, that's my understanding yeah. and expectation. So all of the damage would have been compensated yeah. for. Um, yeah, so that was just my question because sometimes uh, when there's an insurance claim, um, people take that opportunity to upgrade uh, because it's, the construction's <coughs> happening anyway and funds become available and so forth. I just wondered if that valuation was indeed current. And um, so that would be a question for Alpine, I suppose. We can confirm. Okay, thank you. Looking at the Schedule D, uh, I'm thinking about um, number 6.6 .6 in Schedule D around equipment. And I recall the discussion at Council leading to this uh, addition to Schedule D. Uh, and it notes the tenant will, on an ongoing basis, research and implement the use of quieter equipment components where possible. And I recall the discussion at the time was around uh, the possibility of a 
a new um, rear rotor blade. I don't remember what it's called. It was new technology, and, and the council wanted the Alpine to test that rotor blade in, a, in an effort to reduce the noise impact. I, I recall we had reports uh, after some time from Alpine that they had installed this, um, this type of blade on some of their machines and found that there really was very little benefit. Uh, but I'm curious, I guess I will be curious to know if uh, Alpine has done any, any other uh, research or implemented in the use of any other quieter equipment components uh, um, as per section six of D, uh, schedule D. I'm not aware of anything, but it'd be good to hear about that. Recently, uh, I believe they upgraded um, their main rotor on, on I believe, one, one unit anyway, um, uh, to, to what's uh, supposed to be a quieter rotor as well. Yeah. But we will get on, on, on the next uh, delegation in March uh, 17th, uh, we'll ask um, Alpine to provide that, those kinds of details. Super, thank you. I think it'll be really beneficial to have a bit of discussion right now around um, ultimately what decisions council or administration is uh, expecting to bring to council for a decision and uh, I mean, at this point you're looking for direction from council um, to report back on a recommended terms of renewal for schedule d as i mentioned um, my recollection was that in 2011 or yeah 2011 when this lease was signed it was the lease was approved by council and, and in fact renegotiated a, a bit and that's certainly my expectation is that the full lease would come back to council for approval uh, what uh, what are you expecting in, in that regards so right now the focus uh, for administration would be um, to to focus on schedule D um, that's where um, the bulk of I believe the the concerns with the community are, um, and that's the rest. Uh, somewhat of the lease is is administrational responsibility. I believe. I agree that that Schedule D is is really important part of the lease. There are are other sections within the lease that that um, are worth uh, re-examining. Um, Specifically, Section 403. <laughs> um, so I would hope, not would hope, I would expect that the council will have the ultimate um, decision on the final lease. Okay. Ms. Cottle. So currently, as the staff report is written, Mr. Hannes is correct. All that is scheduled to come back to council right. is Schedule D. So if council wants something different, you'll need to. Um, pass a motion indicating what you would like to come back because currently uh, all administration is bringing back is Schedule right. D. And that Schedule D will come back in the future at which point council could yes. provide a motion that yes. the final, that's my expectation. Not to today, we're not making that motion today. Once we see Schedule D then we can respond in a number of ways and that would be one way is to direct admin to bring the full lease back for council approval. Are there other questions at this time from members of council? Uh, just for information, I'll be putting a motion forward. Um, that I'll speak to when the motion's on the table, just around scheduling a town hall evening in the future for a broad public feedback after Schedule D has been presented to Council. Um, do I have any other questions? So if there's no further questions at this time from members of council, thank you very much for your presentation. Okay, so 
from here. Um, if there's no more further questions, I'll forward the recommendation from uh, re uh, that we're requesting from council. We're, we're recommending that council direct the Heliport Monitoring Committee to meet with stakeholder groups to understand stakeholder groups' perspectives regarding the Heliport lease renewal and report to council. And also that council direct administration to report back on the recommended terms of the renewal for Schedule D of the Heliport lease. Thank you. And just before I put motions on the table, I note that um, so the Heliport Monitoring Committee is a committee appointed by council. And um, of course the mayor is ex officio on all committees appointed by council. So um, there's a possibility if I have an opportunity that I'll join the committee in that capacity. Just you can advise um, the committee members of that. Okay. Thanks very much for your presentation. Thank you. You can sit. So at this time, um, I'll move the council direct the Heliport Monitoring Committee to meet with stakeholder groups to understand stakeholder groups' perspectives regarding the Heliport lease renewal and report to council. And speaking to that motion, uh, which I, I will support, I, I want to emphasize our expectation that um, the representative on that committee from Alpine Helicopter will primarily be there in an inform informational sort of a, a way and, and that the final report will be prepared uh, independently by our administration. Is there discussion on that motion? See none, I'll call the question. Those in favor, opposed, motions carried unanimously. I'll move the council direct administration to report back on the recommended terms of renewal for Schedule D of the Heliport le lease. Is there a discussion on that motion? Uh, recognizing that Schedule D is, is um, really the meat of the matter, I think that's going to be one of the most important bits of this piece of work over the next um, several months. So I'm, I'm um, looking forward to having Schedule D before Council for discussion and ultimate decision. So uh, yeah, I'll support that motion, Councillor Comfort. Uh, yes, did you want to put a timeline of any kind on that? No. Like by a certain date or? Okay. Not at this time. All right. Uh, any other discussion on that motion? Seeing none, I'll call the question. Those in favor, opposed, motions carried unanimously. And I have a motion to put on the, uh, on the table. Uh, I'll move that council consider sch sch scheduling a town hall meeting to hear public feedback after the revised Schedule D has been presented to council. So uh, speaking to that amending motion or that secondary motion, I think there'll be value in having the Heliport Monitoring Committee meet with the identified stakeholder uh, groups in order to help administration formulate um, recommendations for revision of Schedule D. Um, but I'm cognizant of the fact that those specific meetings with identified stakeholder groups, which for the most part are business groups, uh, doesn't really provide um, opportunity for general feedback from the public uh, to the proposed Schedule D. Uh, I don't think we can set a date for anything like that at this time because we don't know when Schedule D will come back exactly. But they, this motion is crafted in such a way that it, it behooves council when Schedule D comes back then to schedule a town hall meeting which um, I would stress is, is not a public hearing. It's not a uh, statutory public hearing. It would be like this, uh, an opportunity in council chambers likely for members of the public to just come and share their perspective uh, specifically on Schedule D, but also on the other terms of the lease that are understood at that time. So that motion is on the table. Councillor Hillstead. Uh, thank you, Mayor Borman. Uh, question for you on this amendment. Would it make more sense to do it after Schedule D has come back? 
It is. No, I know, but I just mean like actually at the time of Schedule D to put the, that motion. Any time after okay. the revised Schedule D has been presented to Council. Could be at that meeting, okay. could be post that meeting. Because we're uncertain as to mm -hmm. the timeline, it, we can't put anything really definitive in, in here, but this makes it clear if it's approved that Council intends to allow um, the general public to bring their thoughts to uh, share with us just as we did although different circumstances but with the 2026 Olympic bid Did that answer your question yes councillor Sanford um, thank you mayor Barman um, I guess my question is if that revised schedule D is brought back to council would we be expected to make a decision on that at that point or because we'd want to hear the feedback before we were in a position of making a decision. Uh, my expectation is that admin will be bringing Schedule D back to um, council for uh, support. That, that would be the point of bringing Schedule D. But if you're going to ask for feedback after it's been presented mm -hmm. to council, isn't that too late? Uh, well, no. I mean, Schedule D will, can be modified in the final lease uh, agreement. And so you would be asking for the full lease to come back after Schedule D was considered? So c Schedule D wouldn't be a vote, is that what, is that what you're saying? Um, it's, at one point it will be here for a vote. It may be that Council receives the recommendations for Schedule D, uh, schedules a, a, a town hall prior to you know, the schedule coming for a vote. Or, or could Schedule D be presented at a committee of the whole? Um, there's a number of options. CEO. I, just, I, I think what the, this is alluding to maybe some clarity is needed in your motion uh, around timing and sequencing of things. So I, I, I believe uh, Councillor Sanford is correct. Administration's plan would be to bring Schedule D back to Council for approval. So if you want Schedule D to come back at a committee of the whole, and then uh, as I read this motion, you are considering scheduling a town hall. It's not a fait accompli. At the, at the time, council would have a discussion and debate, and we would need a new motion directing administration to then schedule the town hall. But I, I'm not sure that your motion gets at the, yeah. there's some questions of sequencing and timing yeah. that I think yeah, clarity no, that, is needed. That's a fair point. Um, if it comes to committee of the whole, the committee of the whole for discussion though there's no voting at that meeting so it could be presented for information uh, you could propose an amending or I could take this as a friendly amendment to reword this that um, to have two motions hall be scheduled after schedule D has been presented but before a vote of yeah. council and um, Ms. Cottle just uh, suggested that we have two separate motions, one to have present, Schedule D presented to Council, and then once it's been presented, there would be a town hall, but presented to Council in the context of yeah. uh, So the, the motion the is for Council to consider scheduling a town hall, and that consideration would happen at the time that the schedule is presented to council. But the, again, if you're going to consider a town hall and have a vote on it, you're not able to do that at a committee of the whole meeting. Exactly. So this, you're, you're looking for administration to bring this back, this motion about considering a town hall to a business meeting. Correct. After Schedule D has been presented at a Correct. committee of the whole meeting. Correct. Before you've made a decision on Schedule D, but once you've seen it, to be able to give input, correct? Right, so the public has an opportunity to give council feedback on the schedule prior to council making the final decision on it. Well, I think they, there would be a debate on it. So, so just one more question of clarification. Thank you, Cheryl, or Ms. Hyde, that's helpful, yeah. But the, then when this motion comes back, um, this would just be business arising from the minutes like I'm trying to understand that 
administration wouldn't write a staff report asking council to consider the scheduling of a town hall. It would just be a motion on the record that council debates. Correct. Could be business arising. Could be business arising. And I would yeah. see that motion arising from a member of council. And we could put it. Right. right. Okay. So it from from a sorry from a logistics point, is there anything else we need in this motion to be clear that the consideration is coming back at a business meeting after Schedule D has been to a committee of the whole. Only in as much as it requires a vote, and vote can only happen at a business meeting. Yeah. Okay. Does that wording work for the municipal clerk? Yes. Thank so you, this Council. motion doesn't um, initiate a town hall. This motion just correct. says that we will consider a town hall after yeah. this is presented Once, to council at correct. the committee of the whole. Once we've seen the Schedule D, okay. then we can discuss the benefit of having a town hall. Okay. Thank you. It's a little more or less um, firm a direction than I like to have in a motion usually, but because we don't really know timelines, um, I think this is the best way we can we can make it clear that that's council and in, in, council has the intent of uh, considering a town hall. Councillor Comfort. Um, yeah, I just I have uh, difficulty with the consider. Like, why don't we just say we're going to have a town hall once we know what the because consider says well let's sit around and look at our navels and schedule maybe a town hall meeting. Like, why don't we? Sorry. <laughs> I won't, I won't look at your navel. I, I just, uh, I just, it makes me uncomfortable. Like if, if our intent is to say to the community, we want to consider this in full, and we want to hear from you, why don't we just say that? Yeah. Make that amending motion. Okay. So I would then take out consider and just move that council schedule town hall to hear public feedback after Revised Schedule D has been presented to the Committee of the Whole. And that's an amending motion. I'll accept that as a friendly amendment. Okay. So we'll change that to... That schedule? Correct. Yeah. Councillor Sanford, did you have another... Nope. So the... Um, the motion is that we move that council consider scheduling, or that council schedule a town hall to hear public feedback after the revised Schedule D has been presented to the committee of the whole. Is there discussion on that motion? Seeing none, I'll call the question. Those in favor, opposed? Motions carried with Councillor Hillstead in opposition. And I believe that takes us to the end of the meeting. There is no other business on the agenda. I'll move the council be adjourned. Those in favor? Opposed? We're adjourned. <laughs>